Look with me in 1 Kings chapter 11. And as the Lord has directed me, we're going to come back to the last part of the portion we studied last time, or I should say somewhat in the middle of it. And it's 1 Kings 11, 9 through 13. And I've entitled this study for David's sake. And where you read that, you can read it for Christ's sake. It's for what God purposed to do through David and his covenant with David to bring through his seed that promised one who is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not, as we read these Old Testament characters, it's not because they were righteous in themselves. It's just the opposite. They were sinners just like anybody, and yet God purposed to use them, to raise them up and to accomplish his purpose, sinners though they be, because of his purpose, grace, towards sinners in Christ. So we know that to be true of everyone that God ever raised up in the Old Testament. When you read their names, for example, in Hebrews 11, in that chapter, what I call the Hall of Faith, or the hall of grace, it's not because they were better in their demeanor and morality than anybody else. They were sinners. And I believe that's what we see as we read through the scriptures. God exposes these that men tend to elevate. They think, well, even speaking of Abraham, it must have been that he had a personal obedience that he rendered to God that made him God's choice, not at all. In fact, that's what Paul deals with over there in Romans chapter four. What hath Abraham in any way? If it's because of anything in him, then salvation's not by grace. And the same here with regard to Solomon. You read how in his latter years, the women that he married, the many strange women, Strange wives is what we read there in verse 8. He did everything for them and uh, was drawn himself then into idolatry when they offered burnt incense and sacrifice unto their gods. But if you pause and think a little bit of Solomon as the antitype of the Lord Jesus Christ, because here he is, Think about those that Christ himself came to save and to deliver. His bride is not in any way perfect and moral. We'd have to say that any one of us can be represented by these strange wives offering up burnt incense and sacrifice unto other gods. And yet, just as these belong to Solomon, so those that Christ has married, the bride that God the Father has given him, they are the Lord's, not because of anything specific in them that would be good. There are many of these types that we see here. Even through the Old Testament, you say, well, how could Samson, for example, be the Lord's? Well, he was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's mentioned there in Hebrews 11 along with the rest of them. Yet he was deterred or turned away by Delilah, a Philistine woman that the scripture says he loved. Who put that love in him if it wasn't for the Lord himself to accomplish his purpose? And let's not be like the Pharisees, even with our Lord Jesus Christ, when he sat and ate with publicans and sinners. That was the number one complaint on the part of the Pharisees. They thought themselves above even our Lord. And yet, who is it that he came to save but publicans and sinners? Think of Hosea. The whole book of Hosea was about him going and marrying a prostitute woman. And then going after her when she fled after her other lovers. And yet it was a type and picture of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ for sinners such as we are. So as we read the scriptures looking for Christ, which is how we ought to read them, that's what we look to see how even these 
in their depraved and fallen state, yet were still accomplishing God's purpose and will. And that's why we read here in verse nine that the Lord was angry with Solomon. And yet in spite of that anger, you could say that God's displeasure was upon him. It says here, because his heart was turned away, turned from the Lord God of Israel, which he had appeared on him twice. So you could look at this and say, well, that anger was just then because Solomon was a sinner. And yet in that anger, we still find mercy as we read down through this particular portion for David's sake. And there it's for the covenant's sake that God purposed with David that in spite of Solomon being turned away, yet God never turned away from him. So this is important to see as we've read in Isaiah 53, the chastisement of our peace fell upon our Lord Jesus Christ. We're no better than Solomon. But in that word there in verse nine, the Lord was angry with Solomon. Think about the Lord Jesus Christ as the substitute for sinners, God's wrath being upon him for the people's sake, for these women that he married Whereas they turned his heart away from the Lord God for a season, for a time. I believe that the Lord did grant Solomon repentance when you read the book of Ecclesiastes, especially you read in there where the Lord granted him repentance. But here he stands in contrast to our Lord Jesus Christ, whose heart was never turned away from the Lord. And yet he identified with such sinners to the point where God's wrath was poured out upon him, not for any fault of his own, but because of these that he represented. So there are a lot of parallels that we can find here in this scripture with our Lord by contrast. But it says in verse 10, and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Isn't that the testimony of anybody that has ever been put before God's law and commandment? You notice he's not condemning him here for marrying these women, these that were given to him. That's not what the condemnation is, but in so doing that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. His heart was turned. This is the reason why it was necessary that Christ should come. Because when he came, and as I said, who is it that he married? There's none of us that could look on here and say, well, we're any different. It says that Solomon clave unto these in love. Remember that in verse two? So that wasn't the problem. The problem was that these turned his heart away. And that was necessary. Because had Solomon been perfect, Christ would not have come. It was necessary that these that served as types of our Lord Jesus Christ should fall away. Just like Adam. He was placed there in the garden as God's representative and he fell. He said, well, why didn't God keep him? Well, because God purposed that the last Adam should come. In every, in every sense where Adam fell, Christ obeyed. We can say the same thing here. In every sense where Solomon fell, unable to keep the commandment of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled in his coming, doing, and dying. So we can see in verse 11, wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, now here's where we see judgment with mercy. He says, for as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and will give it to thy servant. Now we're going to be coming up on this part of the story real quickly in the chapters that are coming. That because of this, the Lord would rend the kingdom 
and give it unto his servant. Jeroboam was the servant of Solomon. And when Solomon died, he persuaded the people of the 10 northern tribes to go with him. And he settled up there in Samaria and reestablished the worship of the golden calf. In fact, made two of them, one in the north and one in the, the southern part of, of his kingdom and drew the people away. Now, here's where we see God's providence, because you look at that and you think, well, Jeroboam did an evil deed, yes. And yet, through that, God was working all the while to bring not only condemnation and eventually wiping out those 10 northern tribes to where no one knows, can trace any part of their roots back to them today, but preserving the two southern tribes. And why? Anything because of Solomon? Not for his sake. Let's read on here. Notwithstanding, verse 12, in thy days I will not do it, here it is, for David thy father's sake. So that covenant that God had made with David was to be established and fulfilled because of God's purpose in it, not because David was in any way holy or Solomon in any way holy, but because of God's purpose. So he said, I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. So up there in verse 11, he's talking about, I will give it to thy servant. That would be to Jeroboam. His son was actually Rehoboam. And what is interesting even there, that Rehoboam, to whom God gave the two southern tribes, preserved those two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and that Rehoboam should reign over them. It's interesting that Rehoboam, if you look at 1 Kings chapter 14 and verse 31, he was not the eldest son of Solomon. In fact, in 1 Kings 14, 31, it speaks of Rehoboam, and this is toward the end, because it says in verse 30, there was war between Rehoboam, that would have been Solomon's son, and Jeroboam, that would have been his servant, all their lives. But notice back here in our text, in 1 Kings 11, the Lord said, I will surely rend the kingdom. So this is God doing this, pitting one against the other, and yet all the while accomplishing his purpose. Have you ever had one of those days where it seems like nothing's going right? It seems like everybody's going against each other? You ever stop and think that even that, God's purpose is? To accomplish his will, you might not see the end of that, but the Lord does. He sees the end from the beginning. But the part I want you to see here, who was this Rehoboam? It wasn't even Solomon's first son that many would consider to be in line for the kingdom. It says, and Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. Here it is. And his mother's name was Naama and Ammonitus from Ammon. She was one of these strange wives that the Lord purposed that Rehoboam should come from that lineage. And then it says, Abijam, his son, reigned in his stead. As you continue to track even these in the lineage of Christ, all of these the Lord had preserved for one reason, for Christ's sake. When it says for David's sake, it really means for Christ's sake. Why was it necessary that God divide the northern and southern kingdoms and then preserve that southern kingdom under one head, which was Judah? Why was it necessary that that should be accomplished? Well, it's because the scriptures tell us that it was from the tribe of Judah that the Lord would come. He's the Lion of Judah. And when... Jacob was given his final words to his sons back here in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10. If you look there with me, what is it that he said about Judah? Judah wasn't even the firstborn. It was Reuben. And yet this was to be through Judah. God's sovereign. 
That's what we learn even with regard to Jacob and Esau. Esau might have claimed the birthright, even though he was the twin of Jacob, and yet he lost that birthright purposely, that it might fall on Jacob. But the scriptures say, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. That the younger should serve the elder. Even though Esau came out first, Jacob came out holding his heel. But here in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10, concerning all these tribes, we read the scepter, who holds a scepter but the king, shall not depart from Judah. Now you think, you think about all the days that Rehoboam and Jeroboam were in conflict. We had these ten tribes of the north fighting against those two remaining tribes of the south and yet could not overcome them. And eventually the Lord removed them first. And even in taking Judah and Benjamin out into captivity under Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, the Lord still preserved a remnant and brought them back. Why? For David's sake, for Christ's sake. You think about the history of war and all that took place. Nothing happened by chance. Everyone died that was supposed to die and everyone lived that was supposed to live according to God's purpose. As it says here, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. That word Shiloh literally means to be at peace or tranquility. But here it's referring not to a place, but a person. Well, who is that person? He's the Prince of Peace. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. That scepter would never be removed from Judah until Christ should come. And when he comes, what will he do? Even though we're reading about the scattering of these tribes and all that was taking place, here it says, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. That's what he did is ultimately, even though Solomon's, in Solomon's day, in his kingdom, the Lord purposed nothing but turmoil. And yet through it all, he was preserving a remnant for David's sake. And even being merciful to Solomon in his day, that Solomon should die first before the rending of the kingdom should take place so that he himself would not have to see the consequences even of his own sin. As we, as we read here in 1 Kings 11 and verse 13, Howbeit I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give, you see that, one tribe, one tribe. You say, well, why did God raise up all those other tribes then? Well, to serve his purpose. You stop and think about that. Even our lives here, should God have raised up, uh, any one of us up for a lifetime and given us some measure of peace and comfort in this life and then cast us into hell, he would be just in doing so. Now, you want to start a topic that gets people upset, try that one right there. You mean to tell me God would make creatures just to cast them into hell? Let's read the scriptures. That's his glory. He did it with a whole realm of fallen angels. They didn't have a choice in it. Why would we think any different of ourselves? So I'm thinking about it. If after all is said and done, even sitting here under this gospel, God should say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I'll never be you. That would be his prerogative. Uh, there was a day when I had an issue with that, but not anymore because I know myself to be an abject sinner, but for the grace of God, but for the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We better not be looking anywhere else for hope. Or thinking that somehow, well, God will be merciful to me because at least I'm not like the others. Who told you that? Here it says that he would give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake. That one tribe being preserved, being Judah, was for one reason, for David his servant's sake. That is that covenant that God purposed with David and ultimately for Christ, and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. 
There again, you see God's sovereignty. There's a chosen people. When Shiloh comes, when Christ came, that he gathered unto himself, but there's a chosen people because there's a chosen son. There's a chosen savior. You realize that Christ is God, the Father's first elect, and then his chosen ones in him. So there's a lot of meaning packed into that expression for David, my servant's sake. When you read that, read it for Christ's sake. How vital, how important is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, his personal work to God himself. It's everything. And if we read the scriptures with eyes open, we find out in a hurry, it's not about us. There's none righteous, no, not one. And that even these should have their name registered and kept in this inspired word all these years. It's not because there was anything good in them, but because of what God purposed to do in by through them. In their office, they served as a type of our Lord Jesus Christ, as prophet, priest, and king. But there wasn't any salvation in them. Everything that the Lord did in, by, and through them was for this one who should come through their loins, through their seed, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So I pray that the Lord will bless that to our hearing. Give us ears to hear, mouths to speak for his glory.